Well, good morning. It is good to be with you all today. You can take your Bibles and start turning to Ephesians chapter 4 if you would like to. That would be a great place to go right now. So Ephesians chapter 4, that's page 152 of the back section of the Bible located under the chair in front of you if you need that this morning. I don't know if any of you know this or not, but I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. There you go. That's right. I'm smart. All right. So now let me... Let me tell you a little bit about this. Have you ever observed somebody who went from being on one team to switching to a different team and their entire identity changed because of it? Let let me share with you an example of this. In 2015, a gold glove, that means one of the best fielders in the outfield, was playing on the St. Louis Cardinals. His name was Jason Hayward. We'll get to you in a second. Don't worry. All right. Jason Hayward was playing on the Cardinals team. He had been traded there from the Atlanta Braves. He was an incredible defensive player, did a great job. But at the end of the 2015 season, Jason Hayward decided that he would leave the Cardinals to go to the much superior team within that rivalry, the Chicago Cubs. Now, there were lots of reasons why he decided to do this. I'm sure there were several millions of reasons why he decided to do this, but it became revealed in time that he was actually offered more money to stay and play with the St. Louis Cardinals than he was offered to go to the Chicago Cubs. And so in his press conference, when they were asking him why he decided to leave the Cardinals and the more money and go play for the Chicago Cubs, why would you decide to do that? And he said the statements, well, I believe the core of this Cardinals team is aging, which, by the way, in athletes' terms means in their 30s, right? So, okay, now... The core of the Cardinals team is aging, and I want to sign with a team that will be more likely to win sooner. So he went from one rival to the other rival. And by the way, it was not well received by St. Louis Cardinals fans. In fact, the chants and yells at Jason when he went to St. Louis became dangerous, and security had to be involved to help him safely navigate his time in St. Louis. And by the way, exactly one year later, as the Cubs were tied going into extra innings of the World Series in Game 7, it was Jason Hayward that gathered the team together during a rain delay that many credit his speech as being the reason why the Chicago Cubs ended up winning the championship. By the way, just so we all can clearly see this, he was right. The Cubs won the very next World Series, and the Cardinals, well, they're still trying. What happened, though? Here's what happened. His identity changed, and when his identity changed, his allegiance changed, and as a result of that, it had an impact on who he was. We're continuing our study on building on our heritage together today. We've been spending some time to take the opportunity to not only thank God for all the ways that he's chosen to bless our church, but it's also given us an opportunity to think about the ways that God wants to continue to build our church We don't want to rest on our laurels and get so busy shining our trophies over what God has done that we lose sight of the purpose for which God has given us a church. So so we don't want to do that. We also don't want to get so wrapped up in rushing into new stuff that we have mission drift and stray from the foundation of truth that this church was built upon. So we've spent the first four months of this year focusing on some incredible truths from the book of Ephesians. We've learned a lot about the doctrine of salvation, the the doctrine of the church. And as we saw last week, we observed Paul's prayer for the church. In fact, the first three chapters of Ephesians are heavy on the theology side. We, We learned a whole lot about in chapter one, all about the inner workings of salvation. And we'll notice a little bit of a shift here in the next three chapters. We'll still see some theological truths, but the reality is it gets a whole lot more practical here. A lot of the focus is on what do we do now with the truths that we have already learned. By the way, let me say this to you. If you haven't done this yet, you need to read the book of Ephesians from cover to cover in one sitting. It's a letter. I know we don't get letters anymore, but most of you, when you get a letter, you don't just read the first paragraph and then put it away and pull it back out the next week and read the second paragraph. At least I hope that's not what you would do. So read the book of Ephesians from cover to cover, and it's, it's in a remarkable book, and you'll begin to see things that will pop out to you as you read it in that way. 
Let, let's go to Ephesians 4, uh, 1 through 6, and follow along as I read our passage today. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This past week, I am aware of at least two different individuals that through our counseling ministry chose to accept Christ as their personal Savior. Yeah, that's worth clapping for, that's for sure. And it was awesome to watch this and to, to have this understanding that this happened. What happened? They humbled themselves and they accepted God's free gift of salvation. And then it goes to the next question, now what do I do? You've repented of your sin and your grip on sin, and now you're changed by the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So now, what do you do with this? This is clearly seen in Paul's words in many of his writings. In fact, most of you will probably be familiar with this passage of Scripture from Romans chapter 12 that says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, because Christ has changed you, you ought to be changing as well. You ought to be focusing less on what you were saved from and focusing more on becoming what you were saved to. So here... In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is calling for a change in the way that people are reacting to the gospel's impact in their life and how that should change their unity within the church. A few weeks ago, we talked about how offensive the idea was that the Apostle Paul would take the gospel from the Jews only and begin delivering it to the Gentiles. In fact, we observed that the only thing these two groups had in common was the fact that they hated each other. There was no liking of each other. But Paul was teaching them that there was an expected change that would come from having a relationship in Christ. And so since the doctrine of salvation is so amazing, there must be a change, and that change needs to lead to unity. If God's people are going to walk in unity, then they must do it according to the identity they've been given. Let's spend our time today looking at striving for unity in your walk. We're going to consider three truths to embrace concerning your walk as a Christian. First of all, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. I want you to look at the introductions to the two different sections of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1.1 says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. This greeting looks pretty straightforward, and it's a pretty common greeting for the beginning of an epistle. Paul identifies himself as an apostle. He tells them that he's writing to the church in Ephesus. But now look at his second greeting that he gives, or the second introduction he gives in Ephesians 4, verse 1, where he says this, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Now you might look at these two introductions and think, well, he's trying to communicate the same basic idea. I'm the apostle, you follow the instruction that I'm giving you. But here's what Paul is actually saying with his introduction here in verse 1 of chapter 4. He's imploring the Ephesians to live out their Christian walk in a way that honors God, and he wants it to be so clear to them that he is doing that in his own life. In fact, he's doing that to the extent that he was put in prison for it. And by the way, he would eventually die because of how committed he was to that walk. So Paul calls them to walk in a way that is worthy. He's talking about their day-to-day -day Christian life, the walk. What do you do every day? So let's think about how we can grow on that. First of all, understand your calling. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. What is the calling? 
What is this calling from which you have been called? Well, we've already seen this show up in the book of Ephesians. In fact, just follow along with me as I take you on a review of some of the passages that point to this calling that God has. First of all, Ephesians 1, 4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. Let me ask you this. According to this verse, how much involvement did you have in that process? Look at verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. So he adopted us after he chose us. There's not a whole lot. You can brag about your involvement in this verse. Look at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So not only did he call us and adopt us, but he did it by paying all the price for you. You didn't contribute one bit to that payment. Look at verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Here's another beautiful truth to reflect on. Not only did you need God to call, adopt, and pay the full ransom for your sin, he also has preserved you by sealing you with the Holy Spirit. Do you realize this? If it was left up to you alone to maintain your own newly purchased righteousness, then that would be gone quicker than a pizza at a youth activity. Like, just gone. You couldn't maintain that. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 7. So that in the ages to come, you might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So not only are we overwhelmed by the grace of Christ in the process of salvation, but we will continue to be overwhelmed by the grace of God for all eternity. Now, why did he do all this in his calling of us? Ephesians 1.12 says, To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. When you understand the incredible love of Christ in the salvation process, it leaves you with no room to try to steal some of the glory from God. Have you ever ever seen a person who's part of a group project at school that does absolutely none of the work on the group project at school, and when they get an A, they begin to gloat about how they got an A on that project, and you're like, you did nothing. You contributed nothing to it. Well, listen to this. It's impossible for us, once we read the first chapter of Ephesians, to try to claim any of the glory for what God has done for us. It leaves us with nothing to brag about. By the way, there's also no part of the salvation process that leaves you with any room to look down on another believer. It's impossible to understand the gospel and think that you are better than someone else who has believed in exactly the same way. You all experienced the same transition process. You went from being dead in your trespasses and sins to being made alive in Christ. There's no bragging in your works that led you to be lovable because you're described as a filthy wretch. There's no bragging about your transformation because if God didn't do the work, then you would not be redeemed. So when you understand all the theology of salvation from the first half of Ephesians, it should impact your unity and relationships with those who are also redeemed in the same way. So then what do you do? Well, you have a choice in how you walk. You have a choice in how you walk. Here is a radical truth to consider. It makes absolutely zero sense for a person that understands the theology of salvation that's laid out in this book to then decide to live in the very way that they were living before they were called, adopted, and redeemed. Let let me say it in the terminology of this book from Ephesians chapter 2. It makes zero sense for a person who is dead in their sin but has been made alive through the unexplainable love, mercy, and grace of Christ to then decide to not live as though they are alive in Christ. It makes no sense. Why would you choose to go back to what you've been saved from? Peter said it this way in 2 Peter 1, 10 and 11. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Friend, I'm going to ask you a question that you have to consider. 
Are you walking in a way that is obviously different because you understand what God has done in saving you? Do you understand it, and has it changed who you are? Here's our second truth today. Your walk should display godliness. Your walk should display godliness. How, how does this happen? Well, character is the defining trait or the identifying trait. How many of you have ever tried to make a change in your life, but you were just trying to make that change on your own strength? Anybody ever have that happen? Okay, so like, for instance, maybe you decide this. I'm going to be angry less often. And then, boom, you lose it because someone makes mention that it would be a good change for you to make. And now, you're angry because they are implying that you are an angry person, even though you just clearly said that you are no longer going to be an angry person. Right? Or how about this? I'm going to eat less sugar. Yeah, anybody ever done that one before? Always starts on a Monday, always ends on a Tuesday, right? Okay, so here it is, all right. I'm going to eat less sugar. And then you catch yourself eating ice cream to celebrate your new change. Right? Like, I'll eat less sugar, but I'll celebrate each successful day with a big old bowl of ice cream before I go to bed. Or how about this one? I'm going to get up early every day and go work out. Until the alarm goes off for the fourth time and you just decide you'll start that tomorrow. And pretty soon your workout, your fitness routine is a hit routine. It's you hitting the snooze. Now, why are all these changes often unsuccessful? Here's why. Because the reason for the change is to make an outside change when in reality it might be an inside change that needs to be made. You know, to be able to please God with your life, it has to be energized from within the heart. Godliness is something that God works in you according to his power. You, you can't just put godliness on like you would a different piece of clothing. No, godliness comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let's think about now how your walk is displayed in another way. It's shown in your love for others. Verse 2 says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. The characteristics found here in verse 2 can be seen as a progression of love for others, and at the foundation of this progression is humility. So let's define some terms here from verse 2. First of all, what is humility? Well, humility is the direct opposite of pride. Pride is the absorption of yourself. It's self-serving, it's self-justifying, and self-worshipping all the way to its core. It's not concerned with what is best for others around them, and it's most definitely not concerned with what God thinks. Humility, however, is concentrated on others more than itself. So it sees the needs of others over the needs of itself, and it goes out of its way to always do what is right in God's eyes. It's not trying to take from other people, but rather trying to give in every way possible. Humility is at the center of this kind of life because it realizes that it has everything it needs as a result of the love of God, and because of that, it can afford to give everything it has for the sake of others. Friends, you are not redeemed by anything you did. Therefore, all that you have to offer is what God has given to you. The humble person can freely give sacrificially because they know they will never run out of God's riches. He or she has no need to exalt themselves because they know that God has given them an inheritance far beyond their comprehension. And this humility in one's walk produces gentleness. Gentleness is not an attribute that is generally applauded in our day and age because some people think it's a sign of weakness. But here's what gentleness is. Gentleness doesn't mean that we are wimpy or cowards. No, this word means that we're self-controlled people with a mild spirit. It's to not be quick to be angry, but rather to be quick to be compassionate. People that are gentle can most certainly be people that are strong and courageous. Humility and gentleness result in a completely different approach than the world offers to life. 
Biblical humility stands in contrast to what our society teaches today. Our society teaches us that we need to be self-assertive or we need to be self-loving or we need to be self-confident or we need to be self-serving. But that's completely opposite of what biblical humility teaches us. Instead, biblical humility and gentleness result in people who are reliant on the mercy of Christ, who find their satisfaction in Christ, who find their confidence in the promises of God. And ultimately, this makes him the servant of all. When we understand the mercy that God has shown to us, it causes us to live in a state of being a servant of others. Let me talk about that a little bit. This is different than just serving when it's convenient. This is a willingness to place your value under the needs of others and seek to serve their needs to the glory of God. That means looking for people that you might typically avoid. I just spent this last week at a conference on how churches can be helping to those in the community who are disabled. I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about this in your own heart. But how many folks see families impacted by disabilities and think something along this line? I hope someone does something to help them. What about if you did something to help them? What if you just said hi? In fact, one of the things that was repeatedly said over and over again is, in order to help people who have disabilities, can you just be a friend? Can you do that? What about trying to help the families? What about helping a family with the things of life that may, might be harder to do because there's limitations that are there? So friend, don't just be humble and gentle at times. Instead, live in a spirit of humility and gentleness that looks for ways to serve even to your inconvenience. Now, where does this go? Well, this attribute of gentleness goes on to become patient. Patient. Patience is comes out of humility. Proud people are not patient. Proud people think, who does this person think they are keeping me waiting for my breakfast like this? Or they think, why does this person think I want to drive 15 miles an hour under the speed limit? Don't they know that I am important? Yesterday, I arrived at an airport in Orlando at 7.30 in the morning to get ready to fly back to Indianapolis. Not a really long flight. Shouldn't have taken long, but tons of cancellations and delays and all kinds of things. And so we finally landed about 11 o'clock at night. And I had to constantly be reminding myself, Johnny, you're about to say the words about being patient. So you've got to be patient right now because here's what I was thinking the whole time. Why can't this airline just do their job and get me home on time? When in reality, that's a proud thought. When you have understood the immensity of the love, grace, and mercy of God's salvation, then you will recognize the insignificance of your schedule and you will quickly recognize the sinfulness of your thoughts. Patience is probably easy for us all to at least comprehend because we know it's doing what is right and choosing to love other people even when we are wronged. We know it's doing what is right when everything wrong is coming at you and you're not giving in. By the way, where was Paul when he was writing this letter? He's in prison, right? That's exactly what Paul was doing while he was in prison. He wasn't reviling or scorning those who had put him in jail. He didn't call them names or seek to return just injustice for injustice. No, he suffered patiently, waiting for what? For God's timing for him to be released and to continue spreading the gospel. So we see humility leads to gentleness Gentleness leads to patience, and then patience produces tolerance. Now, when you hear the word tolerance in 2024, you might be taken back at first. You might be saying, wait a second, that's what the world teaches. Like, we should tolerate everyone else, meaning we should accept and affirm what everyone under the sun is doing. That's obviously not what Paul means here. Paul is in no way saying we need to compromise on what is righteous. In fact, this kind of tolerance towards one another is righteous. So what is it? The word tolerance here could also be translated to bear with or to put up with or to endure each other. When all God's people come together to worship, we're reaffirming the truth of the gospel and what God has called us to. 
We firmly believe together that God is calling us to live holy lives, and we firmly agree together that none of us has arrived at that perfect holiness. So, it becomes essential for us to have tolerance if we're going to have unity. Why? Because we could easily be nitpicking each other every day. Instead, we need to be regularly repenting, reconciling with each other, asking for forgiveness, granting forgiveness, and even sometimes overlooking sin we see in our brothers and sisters. Proverbs 19.11 A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. It's easy for us to see other sin and to be ready to confront them. But it takes the Spirit of God in us to help us overlook the wrongs that go against us that don't need to be confronted. We have to be wise in how we do this. Sometimes if it's a sin that is serious, you you can't overlook it. Or other times there might be a pattern of sin that has been established and you need to confront it lovingly. But one way for Christians to show love to other believers is by having grace be your first reaction when you think of that person. By the way, I'm thankful for the reminder that I need to be tolerant of enduring others because I need others to be enduring of me as well. This walk is defined by humility that produces gentleness and then it moves on to patience, which allows us to tolerate one another, which then culminates in what? In unity. Look at number three. Your walk must be defined by unity. Verses 3 through 6 says, Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now what does this mean? First of all, unity is a daily choice. Verse 3 tells us we need to be diligent to preserve the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. That's an important truth for us to remember as believers. If we remember all the incredible lengths God went through to call you, adopt you, redeem you, and set you apart for his glory, and to give you the greatest gift that you could ever receive, then there should be no possible way that you look around at those who have been called, adopted, redeemed, set apart, and forgiven, and think that you're in any way superior. And as a result of this, you should be seeking unity with them. I've been around churches for a long time, and I've seen a whole lot of reasons that people have caused division within churches. I've seen churches divided over things like music styles that will be used within that church, or Bible translations that will be used inside of that church. Or carpet changes? Like, actually, in the church that I grew up in, I saw a gigantic split as a young person that happened within our church because somebody decided to change the painting on the back of the stage from this stripes that looked like UPS had produced it, like that's how colorful it was, right? Like, like that green and brown thing, and someone changed that. And people left the church. Friends, listen. God's given us a beautiful church full of incredible souls who have been forgiven of a lot. But if we don't purposely seek the unity of the church, then it wouldn't take much to damage the unity here. There's a reason why we encourage folks that when you have an offense with somebody, go directly to that person and and talk to them. You don't take a, a mob with you. You don't get everybody else riled up on your side and go to them. There's a reason we encourage that gossip not be something that exists. Let me remind you of this. Gossip always has two willing participants. The one who tells the story and the one who receives the story. So friend, let me say this to you in a very practical way. If you're carrying bitterness over the ways that you have been wronged, or if you've been actively destroying others' opinions of another believer with your bitterly spun narrative, then I beg you to seek forgiveness immediately. I encourage you to spend each day seeking the unity of the church. And if your bitterness has a name... Let me encourage you to go and seek that individual out and talk with them. 
By the way, it's possible they have no idea that they even offended you. If you've been actively sowing discord through gossip, then repent, change, and seek unity. One more hint for you. Struggling with someone, and if you're struggling with someone and you want to fix it, let me encourage you to pray specifically for that person every day. Pray for your heart to be changed towards them and for God to give you a spirit of unity. Here's a Second reason why your walk must be defined by unity, because unity is rooted in God's character. Unity is rooted in God's character. In the character of God, we see unity. Paul lists the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in these verses. And although God is three distinct persons, he's also very much one God. Here's our third reason your walk must be defined by unity. Because unity is seen in God's redemptive plan. I don't know if you picked up on this in the last verses here, but Paul gives us seven reasons to seek unity. Let me run through them quickly and tell you what they mean. He says this, There is one body. There's not two bodies nor several bodies of believers. There's one gigantic body of Christ composed of believers. So we need to be seeking unity because of that. There is one spirit. The same spirit that dwells within one member of the body dwells in all members of the body. It is God's spirit that calls and gifts and directs each member to fit in and work within the body. Romans 8.14 says it this way, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Then he goes on to say this, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. Your, our, future li- our future lives in the new heaven and earth are to be the pattern for the way we live together now. We're going to be together in heaven celebrating God and worshiping and being with God in the same way we ought to be living that way right now. One of my favorite truths that I love to teach the teenagers is that when you accept Christ, your life with Christ starts now and it lasts forever. It's it's eternal from the moment of your salvation. Now listen to me. Shouldn't we be seeking unity even now, not just waiting until later? The hope for eternity, the hope that fills our hearts for such a world is to be the driving force that stirs us to live together in peace and in unity. Titus 2, 12-13 says it this way, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there is one hope in your calling. Next he says there's one Lord. There's one Lord. There's only one Master and King. Every single believer has bowed before the same Lord to become his subject and to receive his orders. And as his subject, we are now instructed to do what? To have one faith. One faith. There are not two faiths, nor several faiths. There's only one faith that leads us to God's presence, and that's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other approach to God. If a person wishes to live with God, to be approved and accepted by him, that person has to approach God through the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes further. There's one baptism. Divisiveness denies and brings shame to the meaning of the ordinance of baptism. It's this divisiveness is a reflection of the depth of our commitment, and it shows that that our sincerity in being baptized was lacking or greatly lacking. It shows that we care little for Christ and for our baptism experience for the great ordinance which initiated us into Christ. In other words, think of it this way. Every time, tonight, I hope you come, church family, when a person gets in the baptismal tank and gets baptized, what are they identifying? They're identifying that they're part of the body with you. They're making that obvious for all to see. And as a result of that one baptism, it ought to lead us to unity. By the way, baptism is a representation of the spiritual baptism that happens. Galatians 3, 27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Or Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 
Um, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 goes further here and tells us the rest of what these ones are. There's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Here's the point. If there is only one God and Father of all believers, then how could he be leading two believers to stand against each other? If you've been called by the same way, by the same means, by the same Lord, then how in the world could God be calling you to be disunified? 1 Corinthians 11.19 says this, for there, also must, for there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Here it is. Friends, how do we stand out to the world around us? By being unified. What does the world do? They're constantly at battle with each other. You don't have to turn on the news but for three minutes to see how divided our world is right now. And what should be the thing that's identifying those who are in Christ? They're unified. Friend, are you walking in unity with your other believers? Let's go to the Lord this morning in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this reminder from your word that we're called to be unified because of what Christ has done for us because of what Christ has done by allowing us to be restored in our relationship with him, it leads us to a perspective that helps us to see those around us not as inferior to us, but rather as, a, as those who are also needing the grace and mercy of Christ. So Lord, help us to live in unity with each other. Help us to seek to, um, to resolve differences quickly so that we can be unified, so that we will stick out to those in the world around us. And we ask all these things in your name.